transformers and fish trucks catalysts for the production of liquid fuels. His co-authors are Zandile H. Tonko, and I don't say that very well, but uh, Doreen Navajo and Michael Clays and Eric Van So you can be prepared for Van Uh, 
The low line here is when the oil has shifted the region into a negative account or the shift region is going to equilibrium. So what we see is if we have 10 limited crystallized land, they go up to about 70% conversion without having the danger that your chemical interface is going to be transformed into a single crystallite of magnetite. The same thing with cobalt, where the interface is now tetra cobalt, and we're going to get the oxidation of tetra cobalt plus or cobalt oxide plus hydrogen. Again, we can calculate that now, under all conditions, will the oxidation of cobalt to cobalt oxide occur? And for 10 minute crystallized value, you go up to a conversion of about 98.5% before you run into the danger of uh, oxidizing your telemetry expression. So these are the factors we have to keep in mind uh, when we talk about maximum utilization of our uh, telemetry material. So let's talk about iron. The iron catalyst, uh, certainly the low density iron catalyst, contains copper as a reduction motor. Why is there? You will say it facilitates the uh, reduction of uh, MP203 to MP304, and therefore we have a higher activity. If you activate hydrogen, you activate the also has enhancements. Uh, and people have said that very loosely that's due to the increased uh, mass specific activity. And the group of Green uh, and Davis have done some net experiments and correlated the change in the activity with kinetic carriers. And we can deduce from there that the change in the adsorption of CO2 to water, so is there just some motion by copper suction? That's all the questions we would like to elucidate. Uh, now, copper has a motor, by the way, nothing new. This is the data generated by Fischer and Cox, 1932. They published this in their book uh, on the uh, synthesis of oil. Uh, and they uh, have put their data yield of liquid products as a function of the copper or silver relative to iron content of the catalyst. We see the increase in copper content, the liquid productivity goes up, and of course there's a maximum that the crop gets too much of the liquid copper. And at the same time, the CO2 production goes up. They also tried silver, which is here. Uh, that didn't seem to be much. Now, we talk now about what is the role of copper, uh, but let's see what the conclusion I can say about this. So this is direct gravitation from this book. Uh, for those who are not familiar with German, I will give a loose translation. Uh, so if you want to explain the function of copper, uh, you need to look at the reduction of the iron oxide. Uh, so copper facilitates the reduction of iron oxide. So we also always say that in the 1930s, that copper acts as a reduction motor. Probably uh, by the activation of hydrogen uh, or of carbon monoxide, uh, which then facilitates the reduction. So we're already alluded there to the effect of the spillover of uh, hydrogen or carbon monoxide to the iron crust. So I said we're going to use low compounds. What all the compounds are we going to use? Now, first of all, we need a comparison. So we put pure compounds of habitat, which is the uh, stable phase for large crystals of iron uh, oxide, and magnite, which is the stable phase for small uh, crystals of iron oxide. Now, we have to think about the process. All the compounds are we going to use to elucidate the growth of copper and silver. So, the work by uh, Black, Squire, and Glazer in the uh, 80s, they say that, that in order to see the promotional effect, you need to have copper and silver in close proximity. Now, how to get copper and silver in close proximity? What we can do is to start synthesizing <coughs> small, oh sorry, uh, mixed metal oxides. So, synthesize spinel copper ferrite and uh, the uh, low side of ferrite uh, as a model for the systems where copper and iron are really in close proximity. And to synthesize also the silver low side. In this case, they have like silver and iron in very close proximity. So, before the fish processes, the uh, catalyst has been activated. 
and you can do that basically in the hundreds of slope. So all habits will be activated in these small systems in hydrogen. So let's first look at the hydrogen. So here we have the uh, relevant components as a function of time to the reduction in hydrogen where we grab the temperature from room temperature to 270 degrees centigrade and then keep ice at all. What we see is that the habit is being reduced to a soft by 270 degrees centigrade converted to the magnetite, which is subsequently reduced to alpha iron. Then the uh, scientists can see that alpha iron uh, oxide is size to produce it, so that the split off of the magnetite crystallite, and we have smaller crystallites of magnetite and <coughs> uh, the somewhat large crystallites of alpha iron, meaning that the uh, sun-centric purity reduction process
And again, these are probably signs of L arm. And here we see a much larger L arm per size, about 15 nanometers. So, incorporation of the copper or silver uh, certainly enhances the reduction of the triangle arm because we have a reductive superposition for the compound. But less actually is copper and silver, which is formed in the reduction. Thus, the assist is the further reduction of magnetized to alpha iron. So that's the problem here. The rate of the reduction of, uh, uh, of the rate of the of alpha iron as a function of the fraction of iron present as magnetized. And you see that here is the rate for the uh, uh, from samples from hematite and magnetite. And here, the sample with copper barrack, and here, the oxide samples. So, you get an enhancement of the rate of reduction from magnetic form. And at that stage, there's no copper or silver acting in the structure anymore. <coughs> so, you get the rate enhancement of about two and a half for the copper barrack, uh, the silver copper barrack, and about uh, 10 for the oxide. So, this will spill over in the system, probably, which assists the reduction of magnetized to alpha iron. So, all about the CO equation. Again, we did that with our model compounds, so hematite and magnetite, that. And what we see is again the normal consecutive reaction. So, we start with our uh, MD203, that goes to our MD304, which is subsequently transformed into our uh, iron carbide. Typically, the main place is the hack iron carbide. If you look at the size of the tank, yeah, you see uh, the size of MP304 is much smaller than the one of the starting magnetite. You get the degree of, of the magnetite crystallite. And the size of your carbide is again smaller than the level of the magnetite, indicating that there's a reductive cleavage of, of this of this carbide phase from our uh, uh, from the magnetite. <coughs> the same thing we can do with magnetite. Um, we start with the smaller crystallite. And uh, what we see now, in addition to the uh, egg carbide, we also see the semitite form, which is probably due to the different uh, chemical potential uh, of the <coughs> carbon in this reduction process, due to the difference in the rate of the reduction process. If you start now with the copper potent system, so first of all, this null copper barite. Yeah. Again, we have the contacted reaction where we have first the reductive decomposition of the copper ferrite going to MP304 and the subsequent carburization towards the carbide. And of course, we get the uh, copper as well. The sinus will obtain, again, it's about 8 to 9 degrees for the uh, uh, carbide, yeah, about uh, 12 uh, nanometers for the copper base. So there are much smaller crystallites when you are uh, operating the CO in comparison to the equation in hydrogen. Well, the similar picture we obtain here for the oxide, and again you see that the onset of the conversation is much, much higher than the, than the copper ferrite. Uh, and again, we can get this structure, the oxide is more stable uh, and it, uh, does not really need to be. Uh, conversation or rather the regular conversation of the carbon phase, of the uh, oxide phase. The silver, again, silver growth uh, is not a stable phase, uh, and it is very high. Uh, uh, the soft conversation rate is 60 degrees centigrade. The sizes we obtain are quite small. Again, it's 8 9 nanometers for the uh, hair carbide. Uh, the silver crystallite will take about 15 nanometers. And the iron oxide crystallites are there still about 18 minutes. So again, we can ask ourselves the question: Does copper or silver actually enhance the carburization of the MP4? Uh, remember the feature alluded to this fact that it may activate the CO or assist in the activation of the CO. And here we see a clear answer with no. For I put here the rate of formation of carbide as a function of the pressure of the iron uh, magnetite phase. 
and we can't see a real effect of the promoter elements of copper or silver on the rate of carbonization. So the promoter elements do facilitate the reduction of F3 and 4 to help iron and hydrogen, but do not the carbonization of F3 and 4 to uh, the carbon phases. So, fish drops. Yeah. We did the fish drop synthesis with these water compounds in the soil liquid yeah, at a pressure of 24, 250 degrees centigrade, a typical low temperature fish drop conditions. Yeah. And the first thing we did is to look at alkaline and a physical mixture of copper and alkaline. What does the physical mixture do? I have the CO population pretty much the same as my globe, it's 60%, 90%. CO2 sensitivity is quite low, 80% on the uh, carbon from the alpha iron, uh, alpha uh, F3, and 14% on the physical mixture. Yeah. And you see the slide we have all the content here as well. Now, if you want to start comparing these low columns, yeah, what we see here is we have a significant enhancement of the CO conversion. Much more than we get for just the physical mixture. We get emphasizing here that this intimate contact between the copper and the silver and the iron base is really uh, necessary. Very surprising for us was this very high conversion of the silver, uh, for example, from the silver to the gold very example. Yeah. So your primary conclusion would be silver is an excellent component. Yeah. So let's look at CO2 information. So we get 8, 9, 10 percent for the samples from your uh, hematite or samples and stenagmite. Yeah. So relatively low CO2 negation. If you start of adding or having in your structure copper or the uh, silver, we see a significant increase in the CO2 sensitivity. And of course, the last explanation here is, of course, you have to add it if you want to get shitty catches copper. But wait a minute. Is silver if you want to get shitty catches? Not as far as I know. And furthermore, the physical mixture didn't do much. So, yes, you get more CO2, but is it going to shift effect? Additionally, you see that the old thing on that, by the way, in some cases, is quite reduced. I won't speak much about that uh, further today. So, what happens to the chemical phases during the visual sensors? So here we look at the fractions of iron uh, uh, present in uh, as a carbide for the various samples. And here in blue, you see often the CO information, and here in the brownish black, often the visual samples. You see immediately that the amount of iron present as carbide during the visual samples has reduced. It. So is the oxidation taking place? Yes, but not of a single crystallite carbide to magnetite. Because you don't have the conversion in fast pressure water necessary for the conversion of this crystallite into a uh, large, well, large crystallite uh, carbide to the magnetite pressure. If you look at the sizes, you'll we'll see that the sizes of the disruptions is simply larger than the sizes we had uh, of the equation. You find that there's some symptoms taking place. So there's significant phase changes taking place uh, during the visual synthesis. One thing which was very interesting for us is when we did the most power spectroscopy on our samples. So the samples from the magnetite, uh, sorry, from the uh, magnetite and from the hematite, we saw a lot of iron present as F3 or 4, some iron present as carbide, and no so called super paramagnetic iron. When we have the samples next the copper uh, smell uh, 
is now derived from anti-lopsided, we see a significant increase in the presence of iron present as the superparameter iron. So what is this superparameter iron? What we did there is we looked at the Osbach spectroscopy yeah, and we find the superparameter iron at the uh, measuring temperature of 298 Kelvin. If you reduce the temperature to 4.2 Kelvin, yeah, uh, your superparameter remains uh, decreased and therefore you can now assign it to either carbon or uh, oxide plates. So we did it for the silver oxide sample where we had 25% of iron here is the superparameter iron. And if we reduce the analysis temperature to 4 or 2 Kelvin, we see that uh, the fraction of time present at the 4 increases to 33%, which is nicely 6 plus 25, which is 31, is about the same as 33. So the superfactor in iron is actually small crystallized of iron oxide. The same you can do for when you uh, solve the CO equation. So we have yeah, 298 Kelvin uh, here. 10% of the iron is present as the uh, MH4, 34% is present as superparameter. 10 plus 34 is 44, and 4.2 thousand gets 48%. So, the question is the superparameter iron is actually an iron oxide. So, where does the super come from? Typically, the literature is say water gas shift. All the focus here again in the experiment we did there, we added just a little mixture of copper and silver. Only that 90%, uh, sorry, 40% solubility here we see. So that's the minimal of what we should be doing. If you look now here, uh, we have other routes to form the CO2, and then the option route from the catalytic surface and the powerization. We pull here the rate of the CO2 formation as a function of the iron present as the superparameter iron is spent catalyst. And we find the linear correlation between the rate of CO2 formation and that iron as the superparameter iron, which is an iron oxide. So this iron oxide, small the of iron oxide, is responsible for the formation of CO2. It's a polarization. This is, by the way, for this high CO2 rate, it's for example, Silver oxide, so we have a high CO2 formation with a high content of superfactor iron. And very low here for the uh, samples X uh, MV2O3. So the CO2 formation is linked to the superfactor iron, which is the an iron oxide, small iron oxide crystallite, and the CO2 is formed by polarization. Some oxygen is still uh, formed by the oxygen. Okay, well, uh, uh, I won't focus much on the play, uh, but the activity can be linked to the carbide surface area. Let me see that. So, so, what I want to leave you there for iron based system is that the cooperation of copper and silver enhances the reduction of the of the oxide, uh, uh, the enhanced rate reduction, uh, but not the rate of carbonization. But the presence of the copper and silver increases the fraction of superfactor iron, thereby, and also increases the fraction of copper and reduces the average size of the FG4. Therefore, we get an enhanced uh, rate of polarization and we get a high rate of disruption just inside the part, but as a negative part, we get a high rate of CO2 formation. So, I'll put it all together in the picture. Yeah? What is this chemical activity? So, if you start here with the working catalyst, so we have here in black the iron carbide, we have magnetized and large ones, we have our copper or silver sitting here. Yeah. Now, as I said, these crystallites of 8 to 10 nanometer carbide crystallites cannot oxidize under the conditions we apply. Not to a single crystal, so one crystal to one crystal uh, cannot be formed. But we can have an oxidative cleavage of the magnetite of from carbon phase. So if the oxygen removal from your cathode phase is very slow, it starts to move into your structure, and the stress in the structure will force the oxidative cleavage of all the uh, 
and they could have to criticize under the Then they sit there, the president of war, the full larger make that criticize, and these make that crystals cannot be recoverized before the uh, uh So what you're saying here is the I is, is not a steady system. It's going through the cycle. Yeah? It has some advantages, yeah? and it maintains our soul and carpet in size, but it has also some disadvantages. It causes stress within the endless part. What is the role of copper and silver in this case? They are copper and silver are just stopping the further sintering of these uh, crystals to form large crystals of So let's look now at copper yeah? So copper also has a reduction of motor yeah, because the reduction of copper is equal to uh, due to the presence of the small crystals Small entities of control of the support. So we need to now reduce our CO2 of war and we simply add a reduction of water, platinum, yeah. and the questions we ask ourselves are how close to the reduction of water to the control and does the reduction of water affect the process? So what we did here is all the system, we use hybrid catalyst. So a hybrid catalyst is where we take a reduction catalyst, say platinum and aluminum, and a cobalt on the aluminum catalyst, and mix them physically together. So we make these catalysts there uh, by the impregnation of cobalt on the aluminum and the impregnation of platinum on the aluminum. We get platinum to the size of about 2 nanometers and cobalt to the size of about 9 nanometers. We did the same for gold, where we now use the anion exchange uh, to get gold to uh, the gamma lunar or the copper lunar, and we get gold to slides about 2 to 4 nanometers. So, reduction products. People could be used there in the DPR. So, DPR has quite complex issues because we don't keep the system as that constant. But, in the support catalyst, we didn't get the multiple peaks. Yeah? And the first peak is simply the uh, nitrate uh, removal. Yeah? You see here the NO peak uh, coming from the uh, reduction of the position of NO. Then we get the CO3 of 4 go to CFO. Then the CFO go to the delta cobalt. And then we get some high temperature peaks here as well, which are simply ascribed to the interaction with the support. Here the peak interaction, and here the actual cobalt eliminate formation. So if you add up the reduction of motor, yeah, we did the experiment here, the car experiment with the cobalt volume, here the co-impregnated uh, reduction of motor and uh, cobalt volume, and here the hybrid catalyst. So cobalt volume, we get three the same peaks and the four from here at high temperature. Yeah, five high temperatures are required now the car to get the reduction of the uh, CO3 4 if you add platinum, in the overhead case, you see clear decrease in the, or shift in the maximum, and that's the, the, the sign of the reduction of motor. Yeah. And indeed, if you have a hypercatalyst, yeah, we see on the in-between stage, still the shift. So even if the platinum is far away from the coal, we still, still see that the benefit of the reduction of motor. With gold, which also test as a reduction of motor, pictures that's clear. Yeah. You get for the uh, co-operator a clear shift in the reduction vector, but the uh, hypercatalyst doesn't seem to be doing much. What we then did is to look at the isothermal reduction. So we all do the experiment with the reduction, so you take the catalyst, you dry it in the TA, yeah, you, uh, then you reduce it, and then you oxidize it. And we record the relative mass change as much of time. And this is here for the cobalt alumina, the hybrid cobalt alumina plus platinum alumina, and the cobalt alumina cobalt platinum alumina. So from here you can calculate that your degree of reduction, you see that the degree of reduction increases even for the hybrid. More interesting is actually here, this picture here on the right hand side, uh, 
Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Uh, I think we have uh, seconds left for, uh, for one, uh, one question. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Thanks.